in a monitoring what's going on in Europe, and they will implement something similar soon in other regions. Uh, I am happy to the next slide, please. I'm happy to say that we have a uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we have uh, uh, great speakers for today. Uh, uh, we have two main topics for today. The first one will be uh, uh, focused on on uh, 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 transit and transshipment mail. More or less, we will focus on overall readiness of or uh, readiness for expectation of and challenges posed by compliance with uh, mail transport plus requirements, especially with ICS2, as I mentioned. Uh, including lessons learned from mail in transit and transshipment proof of concept provided by post carrier and IT provider in the first block. The second block will be focused on complexities of safe transport and handling of lithium batteries in the postal supply chain, providing insight into the various ways to ensure compliance and minimize risk. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, speakers are ready. They have fantastic slides. I'd like just to ask them to really uh, do their best uh, manage presentation within 15 minutes dedicated uh, for them. And uh, and uh, I'd like also to mention that uh, this webinar is not the right platform uh, for uh, great discussions and, 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 and discussion about strategies or something like that. This is a platform to present some ideas or lessons learned to answer some questions uh, uh, re related to that uh, 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 topics, but not uh, 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 this is not discussion platform. And uh, uh, of course, you can ask uh, your questions uh, during the, the webinar in a, a equal, uh, questions and answer block. We will do our best to answer them. If not during the webinar, we will answer all of, the, all of those questions after the webinar, and we will share a link together with link to the record of the meeting uh, to all participants uh, to share our feedback later. So maybe that's all from my side uh, as an introductory remarks. Maybe I'd like to give a floor to Matthew, floor to Matthew. words at the beginning of the workshop. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, my name is Matthew Tang, uh, e-commerce and cargo operations senior manager. And I'm also the co-secretary of the IATA UPU contact committee. So once again, thanks everyone for joining us for today for the sixth webinar. So the topic basically is followed uh, last time in the fifth webinar, we have the survey from the audience. So the majority of the audience would like to focus on the safety and security perspective in the AML operation. That's why we uh, proceed the sixth webinar with uh, first block, security, security related, and the second block will be the safety related. So um, I have nothing to add or as an introduction. So if okay, everyone's ready, and then I would like to hand over to Jürgen from IPC to start the first presentation. Over to you, Jürgen. Thank you. Um, just a practical question. I is Are the slides uh, uh, loaded and I just say next slide or do I need to share my if I, slides? If I may, if I may, Jürgen, I would like to present two more slides before I give the floor to you. Uh, yes, fine. because I'd like to introduce this topic. Uh, uh, we will speak about uh, EAD, especially today about uh, transit and transshipment mail. But uh, I'd like to present uh, first uh, this uh, slide because uh, I'd like to present that International Bureau, uh, UPU, and 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 and, I, uh, and also IATA did a lot of capacity building activities uh, uh, to support carriers and posts to meet these requirements, be ready for that. And thanks also to support from other stakeholders like uh, uh, IPC, European Commission, Post Europe, Air for Europe, and many others, piloting posts, which will uh, be mentioned today, or carriers. We made a great progress. On this slide, you can see that uh, we nearly doubled number of carriers exchanging uh, uh, electronically messages between posts and carriers within two years. We doubled the number of posts uh, uh, exchanging this data. We improved the quality of this data. So we did uh, quite a lot. On the next slide, uh, there is a current status. And you can see that at this moment, we have nine, 190 posts around the world uh, sending messages to carriers. 
158 of them are sending also AR flag, uh, important confirmation of uh, of uh, uh, <clears throat> that mail or guarant guarantee that mail is meeting all requirements uh, from origin post to carry it before handover. So we made a great progress. We monitor also response time. We made a, also progress there in that area, uh, thanks to destination customs. So uh, thanks to all of these capacity building activities, uh, we managed together or jointly uh, that uh, mail uh, to Europe uh, is still flowing. There is no uh, hampering of the mail was not stopped. Uh, there are still some issues. Of course, we are working on them. But in principle, we can say that uh, nothing, nothing uh, serious happened, uh, uh, which could uh, really cause uh, huge uh, problems. Today, we will focus on transit and transshipment. This is another big challenge because for mail to Europe, we succeed more or less. Uh, but mail transiting or transshipped uh, via Europe is still a big challenge. We were working jointly uh, with uh, IPC, IATA, Air for Europe uh, uh, to prepare some kind of technical tool uh, and uh, jointly prepare proof of concept, which was uh, supported also by European Commission. And today, three speakers will speak about that uh, uh, piloting or testing. Uh, they are ready to share their experiences from IT provider point of view. It will be first presentation now by Jorgen. Then uh, we will provide also uh, lessons learned and uh, experiences from careers and post uh, point of view. So, uh, 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 we do our best, keep uh, 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 routing as it is, uh, uh, also through Europe, because EU-based carriers are providing a very good quality. They are EDI capable. So we do our best uh, to uh, keep mail moving uh, through Europe as, as before. So that's uh, from my side. And I uh, apologize, Jorgen. Now it's time for you to, to present uh, uh, a proof of concept from IT provider point of view. Uh, and share some uh, first experiences from test and encourage our others uh, uh, to join us soon. Floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Jan. And uh, this was a very useful introduction and, and very relevant for. Uh, so, can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> so, my uh, presentation will uh, focus on two areas. One is the so called open and closed transit, which is where a, a postal operator in the uh, countries where ICS2 uh, is applicable uh, is, a, is uh, expected to file all items um, uh, in addition to what they were already doing, which is the items that are destined to Europe or to the Norway. The posts are now also required to file items that go in transit from a non EU origin to a non-EU destination, but in transit uh, via Europe uh, through the process of a postal operator. So uh, where the post touches the mail, either the, the a bag or an item. This preloading requirement, I will not go into the details of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the graphs that you see there, uh, but uh, as you may remember from previous um, 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 webinars, uh, in the postal model, an origin post sends the customs data to the destination post. Uh, and uh, in the model where the filing has to be done by a post in Europe for uh, items destined to Europe, that's not a challenge. But for the transit, where the transit operator is processing the items, that's a challenge because the transit post does not normally receive that data. So IPC worked out uh, with its members through the service group where we, where we, as we have already the experience since 2021 to file items destined to Europe uh, on how can we now also help the posts in the ICS2 countries to be able to file items in transit. And the solution that was worked out uh, is uh, dealing with these challenges of not getting the data by working out a configuration table on the one hand that lists all the routes where filing needs to be done for transit uh, and to uh, work on a data copy mechanism. And that has been done in close cooperation mm -hmm. with UPU because both IPC and UPU operate an EDI network over which those data travel to ensure that there's authorization 
to forward the data that are required for the purpose of transit filing. And so uh, the ICS2 service provider in this model, whether it's IPC or another provider, uh, uh, will receive the data so that they can do the necessary uh, filings uh, for the transit operator. Next slide, please. So uh, on the 11th of January, the Comets, Comets is the service group that uh, for, the, for the applications that IPC uses to do filing into ICS2, uh, approved the funding to develop a, a solution module for open and closed transit filing, which we call OCTA. This went into uh, UAT on the 28th of March, and we went into production with Okta on the 16th of April, 2024. Also, we worked very closely with all the stakeholders and particularly uh, with uh, uh, UPU on a, uh, de defining a procedure, a checklist basically, on what steps uh, stakeholders need to take to ensure that transit filing can be set up. So from the transit post perspective, the main actors, as they are the ones that have to file, they're the declarants, they need to have uh, things in place with the origin post that use their transit service, but also uh, the action can be initiated by an origin post that is, wants to know whether there is a filing uh, going to be done by a transit post for a mill that they have an agreement with for transit. So the rollout and the deployment of um, uh, the transit filing is going to be dependent and driven by this procedure. Uh, we'll come in a minute to some details of what's in that procedure. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a clear checklist that ev every stakeholder can check if the necessary is in place uh, to be able to start transit filing. So the technical solution is working as it was designed. Uh, we went into production. We have uh, currently uh, four postal operators, transit operators that have defined uh, transit routes in this configuration table and that are, uh, which is triggering the filing. So we are live in terms of filing for transit. Uh, and in addition, uh, that was also a request from transit post uh, to, for IPC to build a feature that should items arrive that the post handles for which there's no record in the system that any filing was done, that it can still be done, even although it should have, of course, have been filed in advance, preloading, but should it somehow unexpectedly arrive uh, un unannounced, then uh, the post is still liable for filing these items, and though therefore we need a solution for uh, items that even arrive misrouted or, or, or unplanned to be able to be filed. So the solution limitations is that um, the uh, in an open transit, that's where the uh, item uh, of the origin post is put in a bag together with items for the transit post. The transit post opens the bag, takes out the items and then processes it. In that scenario, the post does already get some data uh, for, uh, for filing. Uh, so um, there the, um, uh, um, the, the, the item, data, the item level data will need to be provided to this data copy uh, agreement. Um, so um, the constraint is that it can only work if on one origin destination pair from country, so let's say, uh, uh, from Canada to uh, Iceland, uh, that would be a transit route, that all uh, items from Canada to Iceland will always go uh, via, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Denmark. And uh, that Denmark is the transit operator for all I open transit items to Iceland or closed transit items. Uh, that is the model uh, behind this. We can only um, cover uh, one unique link uh, uh, with this particular solution. Um, so, um, um, yeah, there will also be the uh, possibility to cancel filing should it have been identified that this item is not going through that and that uh, filing was already done. Uh, the, the, that is also part of, uh, um, the, sorry, <laughs> that's uh, a mistake here. Uh, so um, the, 
uh, yeah, it will offer cancel filing solutions, but um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the constraint is that we always work on a one origin post to one destination post uh, routing in uh, with one transit post in the middle. Next slide, please. So um, in order to uh, get this started, uh, uh, there was a lot of promotion by the UPU on uh, seeking ways to test if, uh, the, both the technical solution as well as the procedure on how this can all work, how this can all be initiated. And um, uh, UPU was uh, uh, working hard on getting uh, posts to get actively involved in testing this all out. And we have uh, we are working with uh, the UPU on this uh, um, uh, ongoing test, although we are in basically in production, we're live, but we keep a close eye on how it actually goes. And with the experience on this test, uh, hope to provide the wider community information that is helpful in, in further deploying this. So currently we have uh, test lanes from uh, Brazil, via transit post Poland to the, to the Ukraine and from Georgia via Poland to the Ukraine. Those are the links that are currently operational uh, there, um, uh, but we consider them as, as in a test mode, but they are in, in real life production uh, status, so to say. Uh, there's other uh, routes that are in, uh, in the pipeline of being deployed uh, based on In line with the guidelines and objectives that uh, we have uh, communicated, um, I have seen via the transit post, the transit post, the post based on these guidelines and objectives, so the guidelines and procedures, I must say, and uh, they were also presented at the EPOC. And uh, so any uh, post or any stakeholder interested in knowing more on how to go about this, we can request the uh, Jorgen, I am sorry. I don't know whether only me, but I uh, I have some problem with your mic. Not only you. No, it is almost not audible anymore. Mm -hmm. We cannot hear you well now. We cannot hear you. Must be the white guy here in the room where I am. I hear you perfectly. I don't know what's... Maybe suggesting... Uh, um, I no. Don't know what no. Is. We... no, 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 we cannot hear you well. No. Okay. Uh, try to switch off your micro and try it again. You are muted. I'm very sorry. Do you hear me better now? Mm, probably not. Try to speak. I'm very sorry. I, I don't have ways to at this moment. I don't see what I can do to improve. It must be the connection. Um, okay. I'm sorry, Jorgen. It's it's really not possible to to hear you. It's we cannot hear you. So try to manage that, or maybe maybe Gerrit could continue. Hands. Can you hear me better now? A little bit. Con can you continue? Yes, probably, yes. Try to speak something. Yes, hello. No, no. Uh, I don't know what the problem is. My, my, my mic is not working. I'm very sorry, but we cannot yeah. continue like this. Jan, Jan, Jan. Yes? 
uh, Matthew, uh, maybe we, we uh, on, uh, put it on hold for IPC presentation and then we will come back again after the next speaker. And uh, would it be a good idea? Maybe yes, we I think it's a good idea. I wanted to, to propose the same. Sorry, Jorgen, try to fix the issue or consider whether Gerrit will present, but we will give a floor now to Carlos from Brazil Post and then we will give back floor to you if it's okay, okay? Thank you, yes. I'm sorry, but I, I, I hope it, it will help you to fix the issue. Carlos, I'd like to give the floor to you because Brazil Post was a volunteer to pilot uh, 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 open and closed transit uh, uh, solution and uh, very active from the beginning. So uh, now I'd like to ask you to share your experience and your slides. Uh, to, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bian, for giving me the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead. Oh, okay, perfect. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carlos Lontra. I've been working in the Brazilian Post for 30 years with EAD issues and two projects in supply chain. And since 2021, I'm participating in the regional project security manager of UPU, representing Latin America region. Next slide, please. So here we have our agenda. Our idea is to a uh, brief introduction, some comments, some of our measures introduced it, uh, highlighted the preparation and some lessons learned with part one in general aspects and part two specifically with our topic of today related with transit and shipping. Some KPIs to guide us to understand better what direction we are going, some challenges during this journey and next steps for the second quarter of 2024. Next slide, please. A brief introduction of our current situation and our object today is just to give a presentation about some practical aspects related with lessons learned from ICS2 since October of last year and let's say general aspects and then uh, the implementation for transit and what we are planning and what we are doing with IPC and and PTC, of course. At uh, that moment, it's important to uh, say thank you for the all technical cooperation involved with PTC, involved in some EU post operators and some carriers during this uh, experience. Next slide, please. Yeah, here we have... Uh, a timeline starting general of last year with the implementation of AF flag. It was the first part of ICS2 release two. And then in the February, we did the first pilot with some, some countries at that moment. Uh, I need to say thank you again for all technical cooperation, especially for Spain and Portugal. And Tap Lufthansa and all carriers involved. In May, we it was needed to update our UPU systems. In August, after a workshop in United States, increased the number of partners of you almost cover almost one hundred percent of them. And um, in September, it was an announcement about the postponement of closed transit and transshipment for April of two thousand twenty four. October, we started the full model with release two. Uh, during 2024, it's important to highlight it, the, the revised agreement, including transit countries and the copy of IPMET for that 20 countries. April, our preparation, including that uh, signature of authorization to copy through Postnet ADI message for close transit and for transit and for shipment in the future. And it was planned to start the pilot in May. Since last week, we were able to exchange that message as the as IPC Jordan showed in the in the last presentation. It was needed to see to see some flows of Brazil, including that that topic. Next slide, please. Year number five, it was a logical sequence 
of the preparation. It's important to bear in mind this logical order to reach our objective. So first step started with review closed transit agreement uh, to ensure that all involved uh, are on the same page to that topic. Uh, configure our UPU system with copy of that item at transit country. One more key issue was that that signature of the PTC authorization to COP is uh, exchange for ICS2. Is this topic is more important to cover all data share agreement issues, uh, configure at the exchanges, manage pending heifers. It was continued to be an important issue. Agility in that kind of answer to be prepared in the in the for the future. Uh, carry out pilots and analyze the weak points, the, the some points to uh, improve the process. And then move to production. We are exactly at that moment. Next slide, please. Uh, part one of lessons learned. We, here we can say of general, including October. Uh, the EAD EAD was effective, EAD status check. It was a key, key issue. Um, important, another important point was updated UPU systems, including PNG, to ensure that everything would be under control. We, we noted during this journey that uh, because of ICSQ, it was noted one improvement in cardit and resid exchanging with the carriers. Uh, it confirms what John showed in the, the beginning of our webinar. Uh, the important, continuing improvement of data quality, data quality is a key point. More, the message with more quality has a better chance to receive when it happens different of assessment completely. It's important to put some effort and energy on this topic. Uh, and including some action action plan for improvements in our data capture and our operational flow. Uh, uh, the next is related with agility to deal with answer. Oh, sorry, John. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, and this to deal with these heifers is important to check it uh, constantly. In our case, we check uh, in two parts in the morning and afternoon, and then we we can we can provide agility and flow. Uh, and last but not least, generation of cardit with a window of four and six hours in advance to receive the resin. It's important here to avoid any operation impact, especially for carrier side to refuse some receptacle because they didn't receive uh, the cardit message. Next slide, please. Here, part two, we, we can summarize more with more focus in transit. First step was review that that agreement and uh, to to uh, remember about our the importance of technical operation. Here there were some operators that decided to not provide transit anymore at the moment and to uh, reach the whole uh, infrastructure infrastructure related with technology. Then with that country as if we review that agreement, the signature on a PTC authorization to copy that that message in exchange for ICS2, it was uh, a very important issue, problem, and we were able to cover it. And the next stop is related with prevent operational impacts just by monitoring and some objectives that we need to, to have a kind of target. So generation transmitted item at when it's potent, including the same logical and for the transit country, including that copy, uh, put efforts to ensure that 100% of item at uh, for goods have that message, ensure that we don't, we will have our EMC with assessment completed to avoid any any kind of open heparos during this this process, and 
try to maintain IMAP generation transmission and IP heifers, uh keep the uh, short as possible to avoid any operation again any operation impact and put energy again to ensure 100 percent of carded message with the carriers and sharing experience with you view that there is a, a work group on it uh and may went up a group just to provide some support for the all involved next slide please here are some more practical numbers uh, on one side, we can we can see the percentage, uh, and the other the time, and here we have a, a maybe a trick trick point related with that that time that uh, is measuring the by our generation of item at and when we receive an answer, how item happens, and as we can see, regarding our uh, our flow. We have almost 83% with less than 16 hours, which shows that uh, it's possible to work with, that, with security and, and safety without any operation impact. In less than 16 hours, we have almost covered by, uh, except with two post operators, we can show in the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, here, it was just a summary we populate the number, the percentage, and we can see, to confirm the previous slides, that almost post operations are less than 16 hours. With exception, what well, only two that we still uh, providing some improvements in the flow. Next slide, please. Uh, here, important point to summarize a little bit of what, what we are talking today, some challenge and observation. Point one, very important, related with continuous improvement of data quality to avoid any operation impact, any issue with ICS2. Operational training to dealing with the message, to understand the flow, to ensure that quality that we plan it. Uh, operational planning in the RMA unit. At that moment, we can it's, it's clear that offset exchange and RMA units, all of them need to work online why says two is not something uh, only for offs exchange. Uh, be prepared for next item hyper message when I said to provide requests for screening, for information, do not load. It's important to be prepared. Uh, deal with item hyper message uh, of error. And then it's important to provide some agility in that analysis, lessons learned, learning by doing, and then try to uh, ensure the quality for the model. Last point, uh, close transit and open transit, monitoring the pilot and uh, understanding better some weak points of it. Next slide, please. Oh, and the last one, transshipment is the same. Technical cooperation here with the carriers, it will be necessary. We are working on it. Next slide, please. Next steps. Um, here again, I would like to say, to repeat that it was a voluntary basis uh, to participate. No development was needed. Uh, we didn't need any anything related with the UPU system or anything. It was just a question of organizing and understand the next steps. The pilot what is planned for this this month, probably this week, will be some some news, and we uh, it's important to monitoring this the steps and provide outcomes and lessons learned as soon as possible to other post operators and to, and to uh, especially to my region. And for transshipment, the challenge is related with develop that technical cooperation with the carriers that we are have been talking with them. Probably we will start with one carrier and then spend it for the next. And Especially next week, uh, I will be working in Nightmare version two. That it's an important element for ICS two in the maybe in the next next phase. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you, thank you for the invitation, and one more time, thank you for all technical cooperation involving EU, UPU, IATA, carries, and all involved. It was very important to achieve our goal. Is for meeting with all involved. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Carlos, uh, for your uh, interesting presentation, but also for your very active approach uh, to, to test this solution. I have just a very short comment because you mentioned, and it's very important for all designated operators around the world, uh, which would like to join this project, or this pilot, and, and, uh, and uh, to use this tool, is that you mentioned there was no development needed on your side to, to be able to use that tool. I think it's extremely important to let designated operators that if they want to keep their routings via European Union or via ICS2 territory, they don't need to do any IT development. They just need to present, follow the checklist which will be presented by Jorgen, I hope soon. And th there are some formal issues like to sign some uh, authorization form or something like that, but there is no need for uh, IT development. This is important. My short question, uh, Carlos, to you is that I know that you are piloting uh, this uh, this test uh, with uh, real data now with IPC for routing from Brazil via Poland to Ukraine. I know it's a very small volume for you. It's not the main uh, routing for you or main destination. Are you ready now after successful testing to expand and, and to use this tool for all other routings via European uh, Union territory? I think so. I think this will be the next step after the success of that pilot, and then we can expand and, and continue providing some uh, feedback for you people. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I see no uh, raise hands at this moment. Uh, we try to manage some questions in the uh, chat box, but uh, if I may, I'd like to use the opportunity. Ah, I see somebody is asking for a floor. Now, who is asking for a floor? Uh, Kitest Mazengia, you have a floor. No? No, he, he is not asking for a floor anymore. So I'd like to give a floor, Jorgen, to you to continue where you stopped uh, your presentation. So, Oh, please share his present. I can, can you? Yes. Okay. Is it soft? No, I'm sorry to say, but no. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Jorgen. So. Yeah, I to step in. I'm, uh, uh, I, I made checks in the, in the I am sorry, Jorgen. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. So, if I may, once again, yeah, I will give a floor now to Lufthansa. Yeah. I will sorry, give a can, can Jorgen just try one thing? Like, if the Wi Fi is the problem, if you try deactivating your camera, Jorgen, it might be a bit favorable to the connection. Try, yes, try, Jorgen. I feel it's not that. Uh, um, I feel it's a setting. I am sorry. Um, it didn't help. Not. Too much. <laughs> it was worth a try. <laughs> it didn't help. So, your, your presentation is very important because you are IT provider <clears throat> of that solution. So, I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Rani to present Lufthansa experience with, uh, with the tool. And I hope that you will manage that, or you agree that uh, Gerrit will uh, present those slides. Yes. Please try within the next 10 minutes to fix that issue, because I would really appreciate your presentation after Lufthansa presentation. So now I'd like to give a floor to uh, uh, Rani, uh, to Rani Joseph George from Lufthansa. She was extremely active from the beginning uh, during the drafting of proof of concept, but also uh, to pilot uh, transshipment uh, solution. And I'm happy to give her a floor to share her experience and uh, uh, recommendation maybe uh, for the next steps uh, regarding the transshipment solution. Rani, floor is yours, please. Sure, thank you so much. First of all, thank you for this opportunity to UPU and IATA to speak here and share with everyone the uh, learnings and uh, open points maybe from a carrier's point of view. So I think it's a really nice balance today, the concept that you know we have hopefully uh, incomplete uh, when we solve the IT issues, uh, IPC perspective, uh, perspective or one of the DPOs 
and maybe the, the carrier side to complete it. Really happy we were all uh, working very much together on that. So odd if you can go into the slides. Yes, this is, uh, even though it's not Throwback Thursday, uh, we will make it Throwback Wednesday today. When I was uh, preparing the presentation, can you mute yourself kindly? Oh, yes, I'm working off. Wait, here now? No, still the same disturbance, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, when I was preparing the presentation, I looked into the last one I was privileged to give here. And funny enough, it's pretty much exactly one year back. Uh, there was, I think it was the fourth webinar towards the end of May 2023. And this is one of the slides um, Yeah, I shared at that point of view. So at that time, we were still pre-rollout phase. Uh, yeah, just to, to take you back, I, I brought this in. And so, yeah, today we are sitting together and we can actually share some experiences that we had afterwards while uh, at the last time we were still all preparing. Uh, next, please, Odd. Yeah, so we as carriers have now basically been live with release two for 10 months. Uh, Lufthansa, for example, went live on the 3rd of July. So at this point, we are technically quite smooth, I must say. Of course, as in every implementation, there were hiccups and room for improvement at the beginning. Operationally, we have had a very steep learning curve because, of course, the preloading aspect of the reporting, even though we have had 10 years experience with ICS, let's call it ICS-1 in the cargo world, which is still new to, to airmail. Uh, the preloading aspect was entirely new. So of course, for our entire organization across 300 something stations in so many countries, it was uh, really new and, and a very big process change. We are still trying to keep up the spirit of process compliance, to, to be honest. Um, as you might be aware, uh, there had been ongoing issues with the stability of the actual ICS2 system. So, of course, that also makes it a little hard for us internally to, to establish the real compliance when, you know, there are several occurrences where you say, oh, okay, right now the system is down, so please don't wait for any response. Um, so, yeah, that, that is sort of an additional uh, challenge right now, but I trust uh, that will be worked on too eventually. So, Looking at airmail compliance enforcement, we have uh, since October established that no airmail to EU destination will be accepted without a target that has an AR flag. So that's basically in our system. It is a hard stop, no acceptance and no transport of any mail that does not come with those two uh, criteria. Um, yeah, picking up on what actually Jan started with, sorry, not yet, yeah, <laughs> the carded rate is quite good uh, where the penetration is concerned. However, we still see that not every carded is really helpful because not every carded is entirely formally solid, meaning not uh, in line with the UPU specification. I will go into that uh, a little more uh, soon. Also, what we have seen is, um, yeah, customs, of course, also has a learning curve and uh, let's call it a slow, uh, steady implementation of also, you know, dealing with this so much more data. They are slowly approaching us, investigating, trying to understand also from our point of view, okay, what went wrong here? What happened to this shipment? What happened to this mail con uh, consignment? So yes, we see definitely that uh, while initially everyone was just, I think, fighting to keep their head above water with all these new things going on uh, IT-wise and data amount-wise, slowly they are monitoring compliance and definitely for both cargo and also slowly into airmail. Now we could change what? Yes, so mainly technical challenges that I would like to share. 
Um, we are receiving cardits, but uh, in part, we are receiving cardits that are not entirely compliant with the M48 specification. Uh, let me just point out at this point, I am not an expert in UPU messaging, so I'll try to the best of my ability and understanding to convey what uh, my colleagues have uh, given me. And in case of any questions, we can definitely take that up um, afterwards. So some elements are become conditionally mandatory when using the AR flag. And what's more, they are absolute prerequisite for a carrier to be able to generate a postal airway bill. Postal airway bill might not be relevant for a DPO per se, but it is the language we need and we use in order to facilitate an ICS2 filing for airmail. So those fields are the shipper consignee and also the origin destination. If we have a card without those data elements, our system cannot turn it into a postal airway bill. And in turn, we will not be able to do, excuse me, the pre-arrival reporting for that consignments. Yeah, so what has happened is that um, for some uh, customers, we even had to implement solutions to sort of work around that, yeah, to take that necessary data from, from other, other sources of information. But of course, uh, that is not how it is supposed to be. Standards in messaging, uh, be it in, in cargo or in, in the postal world, are there to make collaboration for all the stakeholders easy and straightforward. Everybody speaks the same language and everybody should have the same interpretation of the message sent. So yeah, kindly asking if you are sending card, it's excellent start. And I think we have come a long way, but please ensure that they are also technically sound and compliant with the M48 specification. What open challenges are concerned, um, I think what is going to catch up with us sooner or later is a communication between carrier and DPO. This is not yet as much of an issue because um, as we know, yes, of course, the European Union is a union, but still different member states have different levels of implementations, um, of the, the Union Customs Code. So eventually, for all the mail coming into Europe, a presentation will also be have to be done for that mail. So that means uh, the full circle will be a preloading is sent to ICS2, then comes the carrier with the pre-arrival, and then upon arrival, the a presentation for the ML will have to be done. So for that uh, presentation, the MRN number that the carrier gets when doing the F42 filing will be required. So currently there is no channel or process of communication established actually between carriers and postal operators. So carriers will have to share that MRN with the postal operators eventually. We have already had some um, DPOs, European ones, approach us, especially in the case where mail was planned on a flight, um, ENS was sent, ENS had to be cancelled by the carrier because eventually it was not on the flight after all. The country's DPO, the EU one who needs to do the presentation, they have the first MRN, they use that for the presentation and then they get an error because obviously the ENS has been canceled and in the current setup, they are not in the know about the new MRN. So there is a lot of manual communication creating sort of effort both on the EU post side as also on the carrier side. So I think we will have to look at that. What is actually the design to be? Is there anything already in place in the background via the STI to distribute this information relevant to the different parties? Or will we have to think of something that, um, that we can set up? 
So before I go in into the second open challenge, uh, just maybe two more remarks. Uh, there also seems to be a not entirely aligned understanding of the requirements, or actually shall we say more about any possible exceptions. So we have had a number of discussions with the certain postal customers regarding exemptions. This might be um, something like military mail. Is it exempt? Does it have to be reported? Or we can see your screen, by the way. Um, and uh, the same also goes for return mail. So if mail has an EU origin, maybe by mistake gets taken out of the EU into a third country and then has to be taken back so that it can go where it was actually supposed to go. Yes, of course, it has an EU origin. Uh, it needs to be returned, but it is now coming from outside of the EU. And with that, at least in my understanding, and that's also how it is in the cargo world, Although it originated from the EU originally, it was taken out and thereby becomes um, subject to ICS2 to be able to return into the EU. Okay, thanks also with that. Yes, we come to the second challenge, transshipment reporting. Um, I was really hoping <laughs> to be able to sort of uh, build on uh, Jürgen's presentation, but hopefully, yeah, after, after me speaking, he will get the chance to sort of share the more technical and uh, ITSP view on this. So as you sure are aware, there was or still is actually sort of a gap for transshipment reporting. Transshipment, just to be clear, being mail that originates in a third country, non-EU, is destined to a third country, non-EU, but for reasons of carrier network is transported to the EU. So since the uh, <clears throat> release one, requirements focused on the destination EU post doing the preloading filing technically. Of course, in the transshipment case, there is no EU post involved. Hence, currently no filing being done. So we did a technical proof of concept. It was a very manual process of triggering messages um, via IPC, in this case, in the POC. So basically, yeah, I think that's a better slide to maybe follow what I'm saying. Thanks. Uh, basically, what happened is um, the data available, ITMAT data available to the postal networks was used for the purpose of generating a preloading ENS. So F43, F44 to the European Union, in this case to Germany, but that's just a side note. Uh, it was done using the carrier as a declarant, but not via the carrier system. So basically the service provider uses the data available anyway to map it into the ICS2 relevant messages. And since there is no EU post that could act as sender or declarant here, the carrier EORI number was used as a declarant EORI sent to um, ICS2. The responses were then mapped back by IPC to the uh, postal network because very relevant point, um, it would have to be the origin post involved here in any referral handling. Uh, the carrier, yes, will be the declarant, but of course we are not owners of the data we don't even have the IT, uh, sorry, the item level data in order to be able to reply to any RFI. Uh, we don't have the authority to open a mail back to conduct any RFS. So definitely heavily relying on uh, cooperation with the origin post. Uh, of course, it needs the origin post's consent in order to be able to do this, that their data can and may be used for the purpose of transshipment reporting. Again, 
at least definitely for us as carriers, it is a requirement to report transshipment mail. There are no more exceptions. Uh, EU Commission made it very clear that there will be no more postponement of any deadlines of reporting the same. So we are already in the situation that it should already be reported. Um, definitely for us in order to be able to continue to offer the service, uh, the filing needs to be done. So everything traveling via the EU needs to be filed in ICS2. Uh, maybe we look at the next slide, Ord. Uh, okay, this is more general. Um, sorry, maybe we can go back one step just to wrap up the POC. So what we have achieved now is to prove technical feasibility. We had a meeting with the EU Commission where we presented this to them. They were happy with the findings. They were happy with the approach. Um, this is going to be achieved technically by sort of establishing, let's call it a routing table um, to tell the system, okay, if you have a shipment from country A to country C, so let's just take uh, Carlos uh, since he was speaking as an example, if it is from Brazil to, I don't know, for example, Korea, you know, in uh, typically this will, might be flown on Lufthansa. So please use Lufthansa as the declarant in this case and report it to German customs because chances are 90% or more it is going to fly via Frankfurt. So with some of those routings, uh, it will be pretty close to 100% sure shot that you can say, yes, this business will always be on this carrier on this routing. For other routings, it will be more of a best guess, okay, maybe in 70%, you know, it typically goes via Spain, Madrid. So we'll use a different carrier and we'll file it to Spain instead. Um, and for some routings, it might be quite unreliable, but in the end, I mean, having a filing to whatever country is the prerequisite and that would still clear the mail to fly, even if the routing in the end is a different one. But as this tells you, there is a bit of uncertainty. Um, yeah, again, the absolute prerequisite is for the origin posts to enter into that data sharing agreement that allows us or the ITSP to send the messages basically with their data when it is available. Uh, process wise, we will definitely also have to pull together a lot, um, seeing that, yeah, we need the origin post for the referral handling uh, and sort of see how we can make all of this fit into sort of the postal business model, yeah, which is quite fast paced the origin post might not even know the routing the shipment is going to take or even which carrier essentially the mail will be handed over to. So it's a bit of assumptions, but given that right now we are standing in front of a great big nothing, um, it is something and I think something that, that we can build on and sort of make it better as long as it is used um, it, it will be a learning, learning object, learning organization kind of thing. But would be great yeah, if we can all sort of work together to yeah, keep the, the postal network alive in you know, all its diversity uh, with all of the choices of the carriers that are available and should remain available. Yes, so almost closing note. What I would like uh, to, to really call out once again to, to all the, the partners, postal partners especially, please follow the carded specification. And if and where possible, provide all the data needed for the postal airway bill creation. Again, shipper consignee origin destination. 
when available and possibly even if the AR flag is not set as currently is the case obviously for transshipment mail, but if we have that data, we as carriers can at least already do the pre-arrival reporting, which you know will really help us uh, to sort of keep customs patients <laughs> with us still doing this business uh, alive for, for some more time. So ICS2 airmail reporting definitely for us as carriers is a regulatory requirement. And if we are not able to fulfill it, it might mean that we will no longer be able to, to transport some airmail consignments. But that said, I would like to close on a very positive note. I think uh, what has been achieved already in this context, as was evident from, from Jan's slides, again, this is new for all of us. It was implemented from zero to a really, really good level right now. Um, personally, I, I am really happy to see the cooperation also through the associations, UPU, IPC, IATA, A4E, and even the, the EU Commission, not sure if anybody's participating, has been a really good exchange, able to clarify any questions, uh, to help each other out, learn from each other, and yeah, in the end, uh, together achieve the compliance here. So massive big thank you from my side to everyone involved. Thank you. Thank you, Rani, for your uh, great presentation. We are running a little bit out of the time, so I'd, I'd like to be very short uh, before I give a floor once again to, to Jorgen. I'd like to <clears throat> have a very short comment to your presentation because you mentioned uh, uh, carded messages. Some, 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 some of them are not uh, uh, fully in compliance with M48 standard. Uh, we do our best. You know very well that we have a monthly compliance reports available for carriers and posts. So through that uh, compliance reports, we are improving uh, compliance performance uh, month by month. But uh, please uh, let us know if you have uh, some specific issue with some specific designated operator, we can help you. But uh, CARDIT with AR flag is mandatory for all designated operators sending mail to PLASI destinations from 1st January 2023, and all of them are capable to do that. So uh, if there are some compliance issues, we can work on that. Uh, I can confirm, uh, Rani, that we do our best to really keep all options uh, for designated operators, uh, transit, transshipment, all options via Europe uh, or uh, with other routing. And uh, I can confirm that the European Commission is also participating today. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is a com short comment. And one last comment is coming from QA uh, box because there was a question from uh, Swiss, from Michael. Uh, he is participating at this moment in Abu Dhabi uh, in the plastic compliance session, and uh, uh, there was there there were some some discussions also on on mail. Uh, I can confirm that I cannot I cannot confirm that postal operators for transshipment will always be using EORI number of air carrier who has the most vel mail volume into the destination country, regardless which air carrier is actually transporting the airmail. We are now testing just, we call it happy pass solution. It means only solution with, with one carrier providing the transshipment from country A to country C via country B. And we cannot say what will happen with other uh, options which still exist. The current testing is not covering all options. And, and uh, I uh, maybe, maybe Jorgen could explain a little bit more, but I'd like to let you know that we are not able to cover all options at this moment. And what we present is presenting of happy pass solution, which is covering only one carrier for transshipment for a special, a specific routing dedicated in authorization form. So uh, uh, just to let you know, uh, and I answered the same uh, in, the, in the chat. Jorgen, one try, uh, we can try once more. Yes, I hope that you hear me now. I can hear you very well. So go ahead and very quickly, oh, please. <laughs> that's a relief. And apologies again and very sorry. But uh, yes, yeah, so I jump straight into it. This is still on open and closed transit. And this is the checklist we worked out in very close cooperation with, uh, with all stakeholders, particularly with UPU. 
And uh, this is to inform all the posts, all the stakeholders on what to do. So step one would be that an origin and a transit DO need to have an agreement in place for the handling of transit mail so that there, uh, as there needs to be a basis for, for doing the filing. There, there's the component of a data sharing agreement. Uh, uh, that is for each transit DO to determine if such a thing needs to be in place in, re in respective to their national legislation. Uh, so it, should it be in place, they need to take action between uh, the post concerned. Then there's the data authorization for ENS filing purpose between the transit and an origin DO. That is to ensure that the data uh, will be provided for use by the transit DO, oh, uh, for use by the transit DO for ENS filing. Uh, a data copy agreement so that the uh, origin post, uh, once all the previous steps are done, has authorized uh, that particular data are going to be sent from the UPU network, uh, uh, um, the PostNet network, to the IPMX network for, of IPC, so that data come in automatically and that based on this configuration table, filing can happen. Now, for the filing to happen, the transit DO is the user of the service provider that does the filing needs to also uh, 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 get put some steps in place with, uh, in this case, IPC to uh, have it set up, which is uh, not going to present those, but they all this information is available. Please let us know, both I, I, either IPC or UPU, uh, uh, that you want to have this set of uh, steps and checklists, and we will send it to you, which will also come with an example of the data authorization uh, form. So uh, the last step is so we, in the beginning, uh, there was a request to different uh, uh, origin DOs to create a new interchange of their customs data, their ITMAT data, and send it straight to the transit post. That particular flow, however, is not used by IPC and is therefore only going to be uh, yeah, potentially uh, impacting reporting and other uh, uh, side effects, negative effects. So we, we uh, call upon each of the posts to use only the data copy authorization mechanism, not the, uh, the direct interchange uh, of ITMET uh, to the transit DO uh, uh, in order for this to work smoothly. So next slide, please. Yes, then it's on uh, on transshipment, and uh, there was a uh, that has been spoken before by by Rani as uh, in, in in more detail. Uh, indeed, there was a very close cooperation between Airlines for Europe (UPU), uh, uh, IAT, and IPC on uh, uh, setting up um, a, a proof of concept. Uh, indeed, for one particular Happy Path use case, as was mentioned by Jan. Uh, we know that there are many potential ways that mail can uh, go from uh, A to B uh, via Europe or not via Europe, or with one airline or multiple airlines via one transit uh, transshipment country or multiple. We have focused on at least checking if it's feasible to do a filing that involves an airline acting as declarant with data that come from an origin post with the service provider in such a way that it's successfully filed in ICS2, that the customs can see the data. And that was the scope of this uh, uh, proof of concept. Uh, we uh, have uh, ensured that we got the cooperation and the approval also in, in, uh, from uh, um, the European Commission, and they have helped set up their conformance testing environment for that purpose. We got the support and uh, cooperation from a German customs through the help of Lufthansa, and Lufthansa, of course, has also been actively involved in getting this to work. So we basically... Um, uh, um, um, uh, well, this is... Uh, I'm not repeating all this. This is the requirement that was referred to before. It is required that also for transshipment mail from non-EU to non-EU, their filing will happen. And as opposed to not involved, like Rani said, it's the airline uh, that uh, in the end uh, will have to do the filing to ensure that everything that comes into uh, the EU and goes out again uh, is, is, is filed. Um, so, uh, and the proof of concept you have referred to already. So the next slide, please. So the, what, uh, a bit more detail on this proof of concept. So I, IPC executed the proof of concept in March, 2024. 
we uh, obfuscated uh, uh, ex real messages, item and predest messages, as they're called in UPU uh, EDI uh, standard messages, and we translated those into the IE3 uh, F43, the item level filing, and the F44, which says which item is in which receptacle. Lufthansa was taken as a declarant, and the Lufthansa AORI number was used. Uh, Germany was the filing uh, member state. Um, German customs were involved in the message flow. Uh, IPC acted as the IT service provider uh, and the uh, sender of the ANS uh, uh, filing messages. Uh, we tested the happy path and the unhappy path. The happy path being that the filing resulted in the receipt of an MRN number uh, and an assessment complete but also the path whereby the filing resulted in an MRN number, but coming with a referral uh, to which a response was sent after which an assessment complete was received. So we went through that scenario. Uh, the solution was uh, that um, the conclusion is that the solution was uh, successful. Uh, we did not uh, detect any technical issues. Uh, German customs confirmed that they saw the data in their end of the system. And, um, and Taksut confirmed that the technical solution also worked on their uh, side. So that as such, conceptually, um, this mechanism is uh, feasible, of course, with the constraint of this being a, a, a very defined use case. And, um, uh, and um, that is, is based on, the, on the, uh, technical uh, testing. The next one. So um, what are now the next steps? Um, so there was a successful uh, proof of concept, uh, uh, similar uh, to a solution that we now use for open and close transit, uh, uh, could be adjusted to also work for transshipment filing. Uh, this solution would be based on this configuration table that's also used for open and close transit. Uh, uh, where, uh, which basically determines which data has to go to the IT service provider to enable the filing. In this case, for transshipment, it would then be on behalf of the airline. The airline will act as the declarant of the filing um, and uh, using an IT service provider that receives data from the origin post for that purpose. So the airlines will um, uh, receive, based on the filing uh, through their provider, the uh, feedback from the ICS2 being an acknowledgement, an assessment complete, or referrals. And the IT service provider, in, in, in case IPC, would translate that back into postal standard messages, item ref, to inform the origin post of the status of the filing, either that it's an assessment complete or there's a referral to act on. The origin post then responds to these referrals in case it's a referral and, uh, and, and through a normal postal uh, um, uh, res uh, um, so a response message on the item ref, the res, uh, uh, um, the item res uh, we uh, will then uh, receive back the feedback that we can translate into a new ENS filing to get to the status of assessment complete in the end. Uh, so uh, the IT service provider in the setup would be responsible to translate the responses and send it back to the uh, European Commission using the airline as the declarant. One of the limitations in this particular setup is that uh, uh, so far this was tested only for the, the, the use case where on one origin destination country pair, it all the mail on that origin destination route would go in transshipment and only in transshipment with one particular airline. So that is the use case for which this uh, can work. Of course, we know that that doesn't cover all the real use cases out there. It is a start and we are assessing in, uh, in, this, in, the, in cooperation in this work group between uh, UPU, uh, IATA, Airlines for Europe, and IPC on how to tackle the other uh, use cases. Um, we have identified some ideas, some ways forward, but they need to be further worked out. The importance was and, uh, to first uh, do this proof of concept to show it can be done, even if it's for a constrained use case. 
There's also some other aspects that are non-technical, mm -hmm. non-operational uh, in, in case of uh, yeah, the, the fact that it is so very specific on how this data uh, copying and sharing works. Um, uh, and um, there's, yeah, it is not a, a solution that is out there and can be deployed tomorrow. From an IPC perspective, um, uh, we are pretty close because of the open and closed transit solution that we have that is similar to what can be used for airlines, although it needs some further um, uh, um, adjustments and investments. But uh, the, there was also there's also an issue that IPC is a, a postal member organization with shareholding posts. So IPC would need to seek a formal approval from the board that it can act as a provider also for airlines in the wider interest of mail and postal the postal industry and its members. And that is confirmed and uh, then a uh, process can start where we can assess what is required to deploy such a system uh, and to work and on, of course, tackling the limitations that, uh, that, that were being referred for the other use cases. So that is the current status um, where IPC is concerned and the experience from an IT uh, service provider when it comes to, uh, to transshipment. I don't know what, still the next slide, please. So that was it. Thank you very much, Jorgen. Uh, we have really um, timing issues uh, now because I don't want to uh, give a uh, I give a unpleasant situation for uh, Matthew and other speakers uh, to push them much more than others. So I see I, I did my best to answer all questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, regarding the uh, compli uh, the, the code list, for example, one or eight uh, D. Uh, compliant uh, IMPC codes and so on. Uh, I think that I don't see any, uh, 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 I see there are some raised hands. I'm sorry, I'm looking who is asking for a floor because we really uh, have an issue uh, with the time. So uh, I will give a floor only to one, uh, to one participant. Uh, I, uh, I would like to ask uh, Sarangerel also uh, to raise a question, but very quickly, please. You have a floor. We cannot hear you at all. So maybe uh, uh, one more uh, attempt huh? uh, with uh, Miriel to you. Would you like to raise a question? I cannot hear uh, uh, any any questions so maybe you can ask uh, in the chat i will do my best to answer so i would like to to close this uh, the first blog uh, with a very very short summary that we wanted to show you that uh, we prepare technical solution we tested technical solution and from technical point of view it works it works with the real data we share experience uh, from uh, uh, brazil and lufthansa uh, uh, we would like to continue in open and closed transit without any problems. Just follow the the checklist which was presented by Jorgen or which was presented during the Postal Operational Council uh, two weeks or three weeks ago. Uh, any post interested uh, can follow the the steps in the in the in the checklist. Regarding the transshipment, there was a comment from Jorgen that even if we tested and everything is technically fine, there is still some some maybe legal issues and IPC is considering uh, to be provider, IT provider for carriers is not fixed yet. Uh, uh, we will continue in the discussion. And uh, if uh, if it's confirmed, then uh, of course we will promote to, to this solution also to other carriers uh, to, to be involved in transshipment because we would like to really uh, do our best to keep as many options as possible. So uh, I... Uh, I'm sorry, but I will close this first session. I'd like to thank to all speakers, and I'd like to give a floor uh, to Matthew to manage the second block. And I apologize that we are delayed. Uh, so I, I hope that you will do your best with your speakers to manage that in time. Thank, thank you, you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Uh, also, thank you, Rani. Thank you, Jürgen, and also Carlos for the first part. So let's go to the second part of the webinar. And uh, we will have the USPSIS, we have IATA, and also we have the UL uh, Research Institutes to talk about batteries in the AML. So before the end of the webinar, I hope everyone can enjoy the journey 
and this is the topic that you ought to know. So the first one is um, uh, Jarrod from USPIS. So if possible, you can take control and then you can start your presentation, but try to keep it uh, short within 10 minutes and reserve more time for the next speakers. Over to you, Jarrod. Uh, thank you, Matthew, Jan, and Odd. I appreciate the opportunity. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon. Um, it is truly really an honor to be here uh, to be invited to participate and to share uh, information. Uh, this is my first IATA um, UPU webinar. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, I'd just like to introduce... Um, our group. So I'm with the inspections, uh, U.S. Postal Inspection Service Hazardous Materials Program. Uh, this is our mission statement, and we primarily focus on four main areas from education, prevention, innovation, and enforcement. Uh, today, so I'm going to try to be as efficient as I can in going through the slides, but uh, today we're going to focus primarily on lithium battery best practices, uh, but we'll go over just a quick overview of the regulation. Um, postal regulation, the industry growth trends, and then uh, top three challenges that we are facing as it relates to DG and lithium batteries. And then finally, uh, the control measures and best practice that we've implemented uh, within our network. So uh, just a quick overview. I know many of you here uh, um, are, uh, this is a known um, uh, information as far as uh, the regulations, but just wanted to point out a few that um, will tie into some of the challenges that we're facing. So generally we are uh, the section two and section one B for standalone, which basically are lithium batteries that are not exceeding 100 watt hours. Um, international shipments only acceptable and restricted when installed and no markings are allowed. So you, this will make sense as soon as I continue here uh, with some of the challenges. So as far as product trends, um, we did, um, uh, participate and attend the largest consumer electronic show, um, uh, which is in Las Vegas in, in January of this year. Um, our team just wanted to see the scope of the expansion. So I'm sure everybody can agree that the team battery is expanding uh, to uh, more densely uh, energy dense uh, batteries for lasting power. Also, products such as clothing and jackets that are operated by lithium battery to uh, essentially provide heat. Now I am in the winter area here in Michigan, so it's definitely uh, a great innovation to have. And then of course your custom-made batteries that are are not within test requirements that are also funneling through e-commerce are being sold on e-commerce that we are also detecting in the mail. Um, but one of the main things that we also found is the expansion of um, larger batteries to operate um, items such as your scooters and e-bikes and skateboards. Uh, we did see quite a bit of companies in the, um, in the industry, in the um, conference that are expanding. And, and here's an example of those types of shipments that we're seeing in the mail. Again, these are over hundred watt hours, so they are prohibited within the um, US mail. Uh, here's a video of a particular product, which I like actually, it's a automated um, lawnmower. Uh, one thing interesting about this, as I read through the specs, so generally the battery, the primary battery is within 100 watt hours, so that would be fine uh, if it's shipped within the mail, but there is a secondary alternate battery that is over 100 watt hours, uh, um, I think intended for longer lasting operation, and that becomes complicated and an issue uh, within the mail stream as it is exceeding the watt hour limits that we allow. So... We're gonna continue on some of the other challenges that we face um, in customer education. And I'm sure that other DPOs are having these common uh, challenges as well. As you know, we are a bit unique, right? Because we cater to basically everyone uh, from individual shippers to vendors that are now engaged in e-commerce to large shippers. I um, mean, here in the US Postal Service, we have over 34,000 uh, retail acceptance locations within the continent as well as our territories. Um, so these can be a challenge, especially with the knowledge of customers and understanding hazmat and DG. And then funneling into e-commerce, so some of these customers are now have found a niche in selling online. So we continue to have 
the same problems, right, in e-commerce with undeclared improper lead, uh, improper declaration and undeclared hazmat and DG, improper preparation, uh, for example, lithium batteries that may have been declared, but they are not in strong outer rigid containers, specifically UN 3480s that are in bubble wraps that we've actually seen that as well. And then there's a dynamic expansion, right? The evolve, the evolving e-commerce um, 10, 15 years ago, it's probably a standard where a person domestically will sell on an e-commerce platform and would ship it domestically. Now we do have, we do found some international nexus where vendors are located overseas they are posting it for domestic, uh, to be sold domestically in the U.S., but they are shipping it in, uh, into the U.S. from from outside of the U.S., as well as, um, you know, recruiting consolidators 3PL domestically to house their products. So there's different layers here and some challenges, posting some challenges because um, we did implement um, recently a policy change so we can better manage hazmat through our hazmat indicator requirement that we launched last year, July of last year. And I will show an example label uh, here shortly, but um, it becomes a challenge for us when there's different layers here from the vendor uh, posting an e-commerce, a different postage platform that's handling that uh, before it's finally inducted into, into our network. And then we also have um, some marking challenges uh, involving your ECLB 3481, 3091 uh, for international, including our APO, DPO, FPO destination. These are our military allied post offices. Uh, they are treated as domestic when it comes to pricing and standard, but when, they, it is, when, when they're shipping uh, dangerous goods, it is treated as international to follow international rules. So these markings that are now pre-printed on these boxes um, are becoming a challenge because they are obviously prohibited into um, the international uh, arena. Uh, um, this particular product here to your right, actually I bought this, I took this photo uh, in, at Costco, but uh, I thought there's a battery in, in, in the fan itself, but it's actually an electric powered fan. And the battery is, is, is basically the button cell that's in the remote control. But notice that there is a marking right on, on the outside of this box. So these are the kinds of the challenges that we're facing uh, when it is being shipped to these uh, destinations. So the best practices and the control measure that we've implemented to try to counter some of these challenges. So I wanted to just share a few. Uh, in the last 18 to 20 months, uh, we have done a great deal of initiatives, implement a lot of initiatives internally. Uh, um, and we broke it apart into the difference from what we can do to address mailer challenges through acceptance and processing within our networks to reporting, right? We do have those reporting. I think some of you here are familiar with the doc portal that we launched. Some of the airlines are now using for our international incidents uh, that they are reporting through those channels so we can address and correct and dive into the root causes of this problem. And then finally, enforcement. Um, the inspection service, we are the law enforcement arm of the U.S. Postal Service, so we do have that uh, capability to assess civil penalty fines, as well as um, uh, criminally, if, if warranted, uh, when it comes to dangerous shipments, including hazmat and dangerous goods within the mail. Uh, we are actively engaged in civil penalties right now uh, for um, frequent offenders uh, that are found to be violating these rules. Um, and then let me just share a few of our best practices. In this day and Some age. Some of our PSAs, um, again, to address the education part of our customers. So let me share this PSA that we have on YouTube that we recently updated uh, last year, uh, within the last two years to, again, spread awareness. In this day and age, most electronic devices are powered by a lithium battery in one form or another. Unfortunately, if they're mishandled, these batteries can pose a significant fire risk. For this reason, they are regulated as hazardous materials and subject to specific transportation requirements. Hi, I'm Eric Manuel, United States Postal Inspector. I'm often asked, can lithium batteries be sent through the mail? In general, the answer is yes. However, specific restrictions apply. Small, low-power lithium batteries, like those found in cell phones, tablets, and laptops, can be sent through the mail as long as they are properly packaged and marked. Large lithium batteries, such as those found in e-bikes, scooters, or electric cars, present a higher level of risk and are prohibited in the mail. 
If you're uncertain about mailing a lithium battery, check with your local post office before mailing or visit USPIS.gov. Uh, we also have initiatives on the prevention side. So we have a, an initiative called the e-commerce hazmat reporting system. It's primarily um, within the inspection service. So we partnered up with some of our e-commerce platforms. Uh, we have a team that scouts uh, postings, uh, vendors posting shipments of large lithium batteries. And if we know, if we observe that they are utilizing the U.S. Postal Service, uh, we have a dedicated law enforcement portal within these platforms that we report these postings and the platforms do take immediate action in suspending this. As a, and this is a proactive measure before it even touches our networks so that we can address this ahead of time. And then internally, um, we have um, enhanced a lot of our communications tools uh, from posters to labels. Uh, again, we have 34,000 locations, so it's a pretty uh, large scope. Uh, so we have all of these posters to remind our clerks as well as our customers that are visiting our lobbies to understand what markings are prohibited. And we've also initiated uh, or developed some labels internally, like the hazmat surface only here label that was recently deployed a couple of years ago, so that our internal processes can be very clear when an, when an item such as a UN3480 is, to, is restricted via the surface network. Um, additionally, we've also developed additional tools to help um, basically spell out the, the regulation. As you know, regulations can be uh, uh, intimidating and, and can be overwhelming to uh, basically clerks that are on our retail window. So we developed, the inspection service developed a retail acceptance counter guide. Uh, within this are 27 of the most common DG, and there are three guides within this guide specifically on lithium batteries from lithium ion, lithium metal, and as well as use, damage, or defective. Uh, that's the other thing that we did in the last two years um, to redirect all use, damage, or defective equipment operated by lithium battery into the surface network. So we're not allowing any of that types of devices to fly. And then on the right here is a scanner that our delivery carriers are using when they are picking up shipments from Customers, we also embedded um, the markings, uh, prohibited markings, as well as hazmat markings, so the carriers are effectively guided as to what markings are prohibited and what markings are potentially acceptable, but they are also segregated so we can better manage the, the flow of hazmat. Now, internally within our processing networks, we've also applied uh, implemented softwares within our system to be able to recognize hazmat labels through our label recognition system. Um, it is still in, you know, being enhanced right now, but it is definitely identifying these lithium battery markings so we can better manage them and redirect them to certain bins. Uh, they are being, especially they are being shipped internationally so we can prevent it from making it out outside of the US or into the airlines uh, warehouse. And then finally, as I've alluded earlier, the hazmat indicators is a major development that we did uh, last year is to require all of our mailers to declare, ha not just to declare hazmat, but to use specific labels, to have embedded coding within the label that will allow us to, uh, our machines to visibly sort hazmat. It will also have the H icon to indicate that that is a hazmat shipment. So it is clearly identified within our network. We've also done extensive trainings, um, specifically our international service center. That is where basically our outgoing mail going outside of the U.S. We have four in the nation uh, and we conducted uh, trainings last year in all tours. So basically 90 percent of the employees that are working 24 seven. So we did eight trainings every day, including at night to to uh, basically spread the awareness. And it actually did pay dividends. Um, so looking at the chart here, three, the blue graph are the DG rejects. They're not all lithium batteries, but majority of them are when it comes to the DG rejects that we are um, receiving back from the airlines as issues and incident. As you can see the graph now in 2024, after we, you know, we, we conducted our training, significant improvement and drops, very, very low numbers now. And we're continuing to, uh, you know, this momentum to go forward again to ensure that the safety of our network. So ultimately, this is the flow that we're looking at um, with 
capturing and mitigating hazmat within our network to include processing and the uh, initiatives that we have in place and the softwares that we have in place. Also, the reporting aspect of it, because we still need the partnership of our airline providers. If something uh, is missed within our networks, um, obviously we can't be 100%. We do need them to report it back to us through the DAC portal so that we can enforce it and we can, um, you know, do corrective measures to include training our employees as well as training the shipper. And finally, um, I know Ronnie had indicated earlier that ultimately it is a shared responsibility. We are all in this together, folks, in ensuring safety in the network, in the mail network as it relates to dangerous goods. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and appreciate the opportunity here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good presentation. And uh, I see there's a Q&A section. Uh, there is one question talking about the UN test. And I will over to my colleague, Ben, to, to answer this question before starting his presentation. And one more reminder that I keep on uh, seeing the question in the Q&A mentioning if we will share the materials after the webinar, the answer is yes. We will upload the videos all the presentation slides in the websites of IATA and also UPU at USO. So um, now may I introduce my colleague, Ben, uh, from IATA, the head of uh, cargo safety and also dangerous goods. So he's going to uh, give you a journey talking about what is prohibited and what is permitted. So over to you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, so, I'll take the uh, questions in the Q&A, and this was around uh, the UN 38.3 test report mandatory. Um, the very short answer is no, it's not. We're talking about um, the control of equipment of uh, containing lithium batteries in the ML system, and that's where it's actually incumbent upon the postal operator to um, control those dangerous goods coming in, so that would include lithium batteries. So it's not mandatory for the designated postal operator to ask for it, um, but it is still mandatory that the battery must have passed the UN 38.3 series tests. So I haven't quite answered the question, but the short answer is it's not mandatory to have it. What does it mean in the real world? What does it mean for the person walking off the street and wants to send something to grandma in a different country? And I think that's where the designated postal operator will look at it and say, well, if it's in original packaging, it looks to be safe, it looks to be sound, it seems to be from a reliable manufacturer, we'll let it go through. Uh, if it's looking a little bit suspicious, if it's looking like it's a battery that's been remanufactured or it's got a little bit fat or a little bit um, discolored, misshapen, then it's more likely that you'll be rejecting it. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll move into uh, my presentation. First, I'd like to thank Gerald. Um, we should be able to save a, a 30 seconds or so because he's covered off some of the prohibited stuff. My background, I was a dangerous goods inspector in Australia with the Civil Aviation Safety Authority for 23 years. And a large proportion of that was working with Australia Post, uh, conducting audits of them, looking at their systems and processes for controlling dangerous goods entering the mail, and also uh, assessing their training programs uh, and training records. We'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. So basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal basis. Now, Gerald covered off the American, um, uh, the United States legislation behind it. I'll, I'll deal with it from a more international perspective. I'll talk a little bit about lithium batteries. I won't go into too much detail because I'm conscious we've got UL laboratories coming next and they'll be far more eloquent than I. I'll talk a little bit about what's permitted and what's prohibited. I've gone for a simple human factors piece. Green is okay, red is not. I'll talk a little bit about the authorized designated postal operators. There's about 38 of them. Um, and this material is probably more relevant for those 38. And then I'll talk a little bit about what's coming in the future. Thank you, Ord. Uh, next slide. So from a legislative perspective, in the center of this slide, we have the UN Subcommittee of Experts on the Transport of Dangerous Goods. And coupled with that is the International Atomic Energy Agency. Together, they produce a UN um, set of model regulations for the transport of dangerous goods that's applicable to all modes of transport. Various regulatory authorities, road, rail, sea, and air, take those international recommendations and then apply it for their particular mode of transport. Next one, thanks, Maud. 
So if we come into lithium batteries themselves, so at the UN level, they've set a series of test criteria. It's called the UN 38.3 series of tests. And in order to be able to be transported, a battery must pass that test. There are two types of lithium batteries that get considered in the classification, UN 3480, which is lithium ion. There's about, well, actually, there are dozens and dozens of chemistries for lithium ion. And then we have UN 3090, which is lithium metal. And again, there are quite a few different chemistries there. The primary concern with lithium batteries is when they enter into a thermal runaway. And I'll touch a little bit more on thermal runaway later. The important thing to note is that when we're talking about batteries by themselves, they're prohibited as cargo on a passenger aircraft. Going a little bit further, so the UN number and the proper shipping name is uh, comes from the UN and the packing instruction that you see at the end of each line there, 966, 967, that's produced by uh, ICAO. Sorry, and you're right to move on and we'll move on to the next slide as well. So here I've produced the text as it comes from the ICAO technical instructions. Now, for those that you don't have access to this, but you do have access to the dangerous goods regulations, uh, that's the IATA product, uh, just replace the, the three in each section with a four. So 232 will become 242. The first three items in that list are, are long and well-established where postal authorities have been able to accept patient specimens. Infectious substances in category B, that's basically diagnostic specimens which are being sent off for screening to um, confirm or uh, a diagnose to may have on a particular patient and then radioactive material in an accepted package. D and E uh, were a little bit more recent and I'll come onto those onto the next slide. I won't read all the wording in it. Um, but the essential part is that when we're getting down into the packing instructions of 967 or 970, as Gerald touched on, there's section one and section two. And you go into each of those packing instructions and you don't just look at section two, you actually drill down further and get to where there's no more than four, no more than four cells or two batteries in a particular package. Now it's at that level that you don't require a label on it. Now, the absence of a label, so I'm, I'm <clears throat> conscious of what Gerald said earlier. So the US has actually structured it so that it is mandatory that a label is not applied. And then, so that's when a package which has a label applied because it has a lithium battery in it, but because it doesn't meet the threshold, will reject a shipment which otherwise appears to be in compliance. In that sense, the US is a little bit more restrictive than um, the rest of the world says it has to be. From, so within the packing instruction, a label isn't required to be there, um, but in terms of what Gerald touched on, it is starting to become a common theme. We'll move on to the next slide, thanks, Ord. So here I've just uh, picked up some text. Again, if you replace the 233 with 243 and 234 with 244, you'll find the corresponding text within the IATA Dangerous Goods Regulations. Just touch on the first bit, 233. This is actually about procedures for all postal operators, not just those that accept lithium batteries or equipment containing lithium batteries. It's about all operators. And the processes have to be subject to review and approval by the Civil Aviation Authority of the state where the mail is accepted. The uh, second part, 244 or 234, that relates to the control of equipment containing lithium batteries into the mail. Thank you. I well, we might move on to the next slide. So here we have the list of the 38 designated postal operators that can accept equipment containing lithium batteries. This list is what's produced in the IATA lithium battery shipping regulations. Uh, but it's actually derived from a, a database that's maintained by the UPU. I've provided the link there so that other, other people can access it. And you'll find that it's a little bit more complete because it'll list every state, uh, whereas we've condensed it down to those that will only contain, uh, those that will only accept equipment containing lithium batteries. 
Thank you. And uh, next slide. So we talked about the UN and um, they're responsible for the development of UN numbers, proper shipping names, the test criteria, classification, some general packing instructions, special provisions, marking and labeling. And as I said, this is relevant for all modes of transport. They made a few changes in 2023, and that's around sodium ion batteries. This is the next thing that's coming that I want people to be aware of. So they've there are two new UN numbers and three proper shipping names. <clears throat> and um, whilst the UN introduced this in 2023, it will take effect in the aviation mode from 2025. And this is for once where regulation is trying to get a little bit ahead of where technology is. Thank you for the next slide. So sodium ion batteries are gonna be subject to the same test criteria as lithium batteries. It's the UN 3083 series tests. Generally, the same packing instructions have been adopted. So whilst I talked before about 965, uh, there'll be a, a, a similar packing instruction. It won't be 965, it'll be um, 972, I think it is. But the general format of it is gonna be the same. <clears throat> and the proper shipping name for sodium ion batteries is actually sodium ion batteries with an organic electrolyte. And on that note, we'll move on to the next slide. So the question now is about sodium ion batteries and are they allowable in the international air mail? So at the moment, designated postal operators, and that's only 38 of them, can currently accept equipment containing lithium batteries. There's no provision at the moment for postal authorities to accept sodium ion batteries that is contained in equipment. And I think that leads to two questions. Is that bad news for DPOs, and is that bad news for e-commerce? The short answer is no, and no, and sorry, you were right to move on to the next slide. The short answer is no and no. Um, sodium ion batteries with an organic electrolyte is something that is emerging as perhaps one of the unknowns. Is it going to become as commonplace as lithium batteries generally? The other reason why it's not a big problem for the DPOs at the moment is that there's 38 of them and it's an appropriate time for them to go back and have a look at what are their processes of controlling it? How do they inform the public as to what batteries are permitted or not permitted? And it enables a refreshment of the relationship between the DPO and the aviation regulator uh, as to how these things are being controlled for entering into the mail. I'm going to pause there uh, and move to the last slide. I'll leave it up there. If there's any questions, feel free to send me an email. And on that note, I'll hand back to Matthew and hopefully give him a little bit of time back for UL Laboratories. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ben. And uh, in the Q&A section, there's uh, one question asking about uh, what is the uh, how many packages of the lithium battery can put in one receptacle and uh, according to the UPU's uh, feedback basically uh, they have the limitation only within one postal item so uh, if you have any comments or ideas yeah feel free to, to share absolutely it is one per package so you can't combine a number of packages into a bigger pack and then send that is the short answer okay once again thank you Ben and um so the last presentation will be from ESRI, UL Research Institute. We have Judy, and we'll talk about the safety challenges of lithium ion cells and batteries. And we are over to you, Judy. Thank you. I'm uh, sharing my screen. And let me know if you can see it. Yes, I can see. I'm trying to see if I can put it on. So better. So um, today I'm going to quickly talk about. Um, uh, do we have any time restriction? I can. I I might take about twelve minutes or so. Okay. 
Uh, today, I'm going to talk about safety challenges of lithium ion uh, cells and batteries. And, um, you know, I uh, lead the Electrochemical Safety Research Institute at UL Research Institutes, and our mission is to advance safer energy storage through science. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the background, but basically, lithium ion batteries are everywhere today. Uh, they are used from all the way from consumer electronics to electric vehicles and stationary grid energy storage. Uh, and with all the advantages, they also have a very high propensity to experience fire and thermal runaway if they're not designed or used correctly. And this goes all the way from cell to um, a battery level. If the design of the cell is not good, or even if the design of the battery is not good, or if either of them is not used correctly, you can have uh, thermal runaway and fires. And uh, that's a lot of challenge because there are many different cathode and anode chemistries that can be used for lithium ion. And also uh, it is very difficult because of the millions of cells that are manufactured. It's very difficult to test every one of them and also know if there are problems. Uh, similarly, you know, when batteries are made, it's also more challenging to test, test every battery before it's put out in the market. Uh, so, but in general, most of the time we see uh, fires and uh, there have been quite a few that have been uh, seen in transit, in storage, in usage, and so on. And sometimes they have been accompanied by catastrophic incidents. Um, one of the things that we've seen is the 1990s, we saw really small battery packs uh, that were used for cameras, camcorders, laptops, and so on. But today we are seeing batteries in electric vehicles, other e-mobility, and also in grid energy storage systems. So we've gone from uh, low watt hours all the way to megawatt hours and gigawatt hours. And you can see that there are a variety of things that can happen, even with a single e-cigarette battery that can be pretty big damage if there is a fire. Uh, as you can see in that first picture on the right here, uh, there's not only injury to the person, but also there's a lot of damage to the carpet, to the furniture, to the blinds and so on. Um, yeah, the um, hoverboards have had a, a pretty big, uh, you know, they were uh, catastrophic at a certain point. And so there were some standards written for that. We've seen incidents in cell manufacturing as well as battery recycling facilities. Uh, these are just some examples around the world where there have been incidents in storage facilities. I think we have a lot of data that is related to uh, incidents we've seen um, in the cargo compartments or uh, even in transportation, uh, ground transportation as well as air transportation. Uh, but I wanted to show a little bit about this storage facility uh, or in transit to storage facilities uh, that were observed. So there's quite a few, and as you can see, it's all over the world. It's not just in one location. Um, some of the things that we need to think about when we look into uh, batteries is two main categories that categorize safety, and that's energy and toxicity. And energy, as a, you know, we just looked at it, uh, it can go anywhere from small batteries all the way to megawatt hour and gigawatt hour batteries. And the larger your battery, the larger your fire is going to be. Um, and so when, but the other factor is toxicity, which uh, a lot of people don't think about. Uh, batteries do have a toxicity associated with them. Some could be more like corrosiveness, which uh, is in, um, in alkaline and um, uh, aqueous type batteries. And this, um, you know, is um, aqueous type batteries. And this you can see with metal hydrides, NICAD, alkaline batteries, and so on. Um, but with lithium ion and some of the other lithium chemistries like um, uh, lithium MnO2 and lithium CFX, we have an organic electrolyte. And so that can be, that can cause different types of hazards because you also have a salt associated with it. And at that, and with those, what we see is that um, there could be HF that's generated that could be toxic, uh, which has a very low PP, uh, TLV, that's a threshold limit value. Uh, and you can also have metals in the case of lithium ion that comes out from the cathodes when you have a thermal runaway and a fire that can also, if it is a, a long-term exposure to these metals, they can also cause other uh, toxicity concerns in, for human beings. 
Um, just quickly uh, want to mention uh, the different types of hazards that are, that are related to uh, lithium ion. Uh, they could be broadly categorized into thermal, mechanical, and electrical. When you look at these types of hazards, the electrical hazards are the ones that we uh, understand very well. And we pretty much can control um, the electrical hazards by using at least two levels of tolerance, uh, failure tolerance. Um, the thermal is also somewhat well understood because there are things that we understand when it's either exposed to very hot or very cold temperatures. And there are ways that you can also control that by warming up the battery to the right level or by cooling down the battery if it gets too warm. Uh, the main uh, you know, one that we have uh, we don't have a good understanding is the mechanical hazards because that involves um, the you know uneven road surfaces that where we cannot tell what the vibration is going to be like or the impact or the shocks are going to be like. And then of course, when we have accidents, there are impacts that could or uh, uh, you know that could affect uh, the battery itself. And, and cause a ca catastrophic hazard. Uh, these are some of the hazards that are related, uh, that are well known and are related to electrical as well as thermal. Uh, overcharge, um, repeated over discharge, but it's followed by charging, not overcharge, but regular charge. Um, external shots, which could be high or low impedance. And then of course, thermal environments, whether it's high or extreme thermal environments, whether it's high or low temperatures, all of these can actually uh, cause ha hazards uh, with lithium ion batteries. And another thing that can happen is also internal short circuits, which can happen by two, two means. One is if you have a manufacturing defect and it was not identified in the manufacturing facility, but it's out there in the market, then it's possible that they could become nucleation sites for uh, further internal shots to develop and uh, cause a catastrophic hazard or you could also have any of these other conditions, electrical hazards or thermal hazards, sorry, electrical of nominal conditions or thermal uh, environments that can actually cause an internal shot to develop in the field. So these are just some examples what can happen uh, uh, under overcharge conditions. You have over voltage or high, high rate charge, and so you can develop high temperatures, venting, fire, and thermal runaway. With over discharge, if you do an extreme over discharge, you can actually kill the cell. But if you have a subtle over discharges, you can deposit, um, you can actually dissolve copper, um, uh, copper into the solution, into the electrolyte, and then during the subsequent charge, it can get uh, deposited on the cathode, anode, and separator, and then it can actually cause a hindrance to the movement of lithium ions coming out of the cathode or uh, for the lithium ions entering the anode, and so that can cause high temperatures. And uh, usually what we see is during the charge cycle, uh, even if, uh, if there's no overcharge, we actually see uh, thermal runway and a fire that happens. And so it's very important that there are controls that are placed for over discharge also and uh, for the under voltage uh, cutoff. High and low impedance shots, these are mostly taken care of uh, by good design. You can have uh, fuses for the uh, low impedance shots. For the high impedance shots, you need to make sure that you design the battery correctly by anodizing the container on the insides of the container. Uh, you ha don't have any uh, chafing or cracking of the cables and wires. Uh, you make sure that the cables and wires have the right uh, current carrying capability and so on. So there's a lot of things that you can do to prevent external short circuits. And of course, internal short circuits really you know, are controlled by all of these different conditions, as well as making sure that the manufacturing process is extremely high quality. So there are no defects that I introduced. Uh, I show some examples of defects that have been found uh, with different cell designs. So it's best not to have any of these defects uh, and make sure that you do some kind of a audit for quality checks and uh, confirm that uh, you do have a very high quality uh, manufacturing line. Another concern that we have in the market is counterfeit uh, cells and batteries. And um, I have a couple of videos that I can quickly show with the original manufacturer 
we typically do not see any problems with uh, conditions like overcharge because they have a safety feature in them. But with uh, with the uh, counterfeit, which looks exactly like uh, the original manufacturer, also has the same color label and so on. Uh, we find that uh, under the same condition, they actually have a, a you know venting with release of electrolyte. Sometimes you could have a fire. And this is because they do not implement the safety features that are implemented in an uh, in the cell design that is created by the original manufacturer. So you can see pictures on the right, uh, on the left also, where we did an overcharge test. Here, they actually took a uh, used lithium ion cell and placed it inside another container. And they put a circuit board that would uh, provide protection. When we did some testing, we found that even though the cell was labeled, the old cell was labeled 1300, we got about 600 milliamp hour capacity. And when we removed this, uh, the circuit board and we tested it for overcharge, uh, the cell should have protection against overcharge, but we found that it, the cell experienced a fire and expelled its contents. So uh, it's this is also a major concern for us that there are counterfeit cells and batteries that are, um, you know, that are not safe, and uh, but they look very similar to um, the original manufacturer. So um, the other thing that is a concern for lithium ion is um, the particles and gases that are released during a thermal runaway. What we find is that when we, we can have either uh, smoke or fire during a thermal runaway, uh, in this case, this, our top picture is a lithium ion uh, battery with cell with an NMC electrolyte that had only smoke. And then uh, we also found that with a LFP, uh, we actually uh, found cases where we could have a fire and smoke, or we, it could be just fire. So uh, what we find is that the composition of the gases that are released during fire and smoke is uh, has carbon monoxide, hydrogen, methane, and other hydrocarbons that are above LFL. And we also have metal contaminants that are released that are uh, very high, uh, much higher, sometimes six orders of magnitude higher than what is allowed um, for, for human beings to breathe. Uh, we also have concerns with HF toxicity because the electrolyte uh, has um, LIPF6, which can release hydrogen uh, fluoride or hydrofluoric acid that can be very toxic to a human being. So um, just quickly wanted to say a few things about storing lithium ion batteries. Uh, there are a lot of you know, considerations that to, need to be uh, uh, looked into. Uh, it's always better to store them in a cool, well, dry, ventilated area away from combustible metal materials and other hazardous materials. They should not allow be allowed to come in contact with water. We should make sure that there is no inadvertent terminal contact or we might have a short circuit. We need to make sure that we don't stack it in a way, the boxes in a way that uh, it causes puncturing or crushing of the cells and batteries. Uh, we need to avoid shock and vibration to the batteries, making sure that they are uh, well um, you know, protected from uh, inadvertent shock and vibration. And they should also be stored in their original containers as much as possible. And mixing of battery types during storage is also, should also be avoided. For instance, mixing lead acids and uh, metal hydrides or lithium ions should be avoided because some of the chemistries can also vent flammable hydrogen gases like the aqueous chemistries. And so it could pose a hazard to the lithium ion batteries. And also, uh, it's also good to visually inspect these battery storage areas regularly. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention quickly was damage defective and or recall batteries. It's all, if you know that there's a questionable quality of the batteries that are being uh, shipped or stored. It's always good to store them at very low temperatures because that actually freezes the electrolyte. And so you can prevent any hazards from uh, further occurring with these uh, damaged def defective or recall batteries. So the temperatures you know, recommended are, are really cold storage up down to freezing. And they should also be placed in heavy metal cages if you know that there is a problem with the particular battery. 
And um, uh, again, I said, you know, make sure that uh, it prevents short circuits. They should be in original shipping containers. And also, when these batteries are being removed from cold storage, we need to make sure that there's no condensation because that can then uh, result in short circuiting the batteries and the cells. Um, then uh, also another thing that needs to be considered is making sure that any battery, for instance, when it's stored, it should not be placed in uh, areas of high temperature or exposure to direct sunlight. Typical operating temperatures for batteries are between C zero to 40 degrees C. So that should be taken into consideration because as you get to warmer temperatures, electrolyte decomposition starts happening and other changes in the battery starts happening. So there's always a good, uh, it should always stored at low temperatures in order to maintain uh, safety and also extend the life of the battery. Um, other things, of course, you know, talked about uh, counterfeit, uh, undeclared shipments, um, and then also uh, making sure that uh, there's no other, you know, um, uh, areas or environments that can actually cause more issues like adiabatic uh, insulation and so on. Uh, and then what to do in an emergency, of course, appropriate PPE, which includes um, good gloves uh, and uh, face protection and so on should be used. Uh, fire extinguishers can be either Litex or ABC. Typically we talk about ABC because this is, uh, uh, it generates electrolyte or gases which are more acidic. And so we prefer ABC. Litex is typically used for lithium metal fires. So if your lithium ion cell has a lithium metal as a, a anode, you can use a Litex uh, extinguisher. But in general, most lithium ions do not have a lithium metal as an anode. So it's better to use an ABC extinguisher. Copious amounts of water is still the best uh, way to put out a lithium uh, ion fire. But of course, if, it, if you have lithium metal, it's not good to use water. Uh, it's also good to use an IR cam thermal sensor to understand what the temperature of the battery is before actually trying to touch it. Um, if you have electrolyte leaks, copious amounts of water will work, but you can also neutralize it with sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate. And um, uh, in the event of uh, you know catastrophic failure where there's physical injury, it's advisable to go to the ER. Um, this is just a lot of information on fire suppression. As I mentioned, you know, we've done a lot of work on fire suppression uh, in recent years. And what we find is that you need to have a certain density as well as uh, density of the fire suppressant in the vicinity of the cells that are warm. And it also needs to be present for the duration that it requires to cool down every single cell in that battery pack. And so uh, that is a limitation. And so what we found is that uh, since typically water you know, is available in plenty, we've been able to use water successfully to put out fires. Uh, but with some of the other agents like nitrogen or commercial agents that are used like aerosols, um, there is a limitation because of the volume that is contained in a cylinder. And so we are not able to have enough density of that particular a suppressant that would uh, you know, put, put out the fire and prevent a reignition. Uh, with lithium ion batteries, if you don't complete, bring them completely, all the cells completely to room temperature and, and maintain it there, then you can have a reignition because a fire a heat can sus um, sustain and cause a reignition of the lithium ion. So, well, one thing we did find is that water can completely cool it. Uh, so that is that is still been a very good source of our uh, extinguishing agent. Um, some of the things that can be used for fire detection is conventional heat detectors, smoke detectors, or, com or combination of smoke and heat detectors, and also gas detectors. Today, in the uh, there are not very good heat, uh, sorry, gas detectors in the market because most gas detectors that are available in the market uh, get overwhelmed by the amount of smoke that is produced uh, in a lithium ion uh, cell or a battery fire. And so they are unable to provide um, a good detection of the type of gases that are evolved uh, with the lithium ion fire. 
There's some factors to consider for lithium ion storage, ventilation, toxic gas sensors, oxygen uh, sensors I just mentioned. Those are a little bit more challenging today. Um, and then physical access for first responders and firefighters, make sure that they're able to get to it and uh, at the proper, uh, there's a proper path for them to get to it. Uh, proper PPE and respirators should be used as it gas respira respirators are required for lithium ion battery fires. And of course, to have the relevant fire extinguishing uh, capability. Uh, again, similar things that I've listed here. Um, you know, I'll be sharing this presentation. So if people have any questions, you can ask. Uh, also, one thing I would recommend is the use of IR cameras because um, when there's a very heavy smoke uh, that comes out of these batteries, the IR camera provide very good uh, detail on what type of temperatures are being experienced. And so that's highly recommended before someone tries to enter a smoke-rich environment uh, to put out a lithium-ion battery fire. Uh, so to conclude, I would say lithium-ion thermal runaway can happen due to many different causes. Uh, but So it's very important to uh, make sure for people who build cells and batteries to understand the limitations under off nominal conditions and to design uh, their cells and batteries in the right manner. High fidelity thermal analysis can also be used uh, to design the batteries correctly in terms of heat dissipation paths. Um, and then um, the, the events that accompany thermal runaway can be venting or fire and uh, you know venting or uh, fire or smoke or combinations of these. Uh, toxic and flammable gases are released from lithium-ion batteries, and there's also particulate emissions where the particulate uh, where the peak particulate um, number levels are six orders of magnitude or higher, and carbon black levels are also much higher than human exposure limits, safe human exposure limits. Um, first responders and firefighters require appropriate PPE and water or the suppressant runoff, which I didn't talk too much about, uh, may also be toxic. And so it should not be allowed to le leach into the ground. This is something we are also doing analysis on with all our fire suppression work, where we look at the runoff and study the composition of the runoff to confirm, uh, in, because we usually collect these and we um, we actually dispose of them as hazardous waste. So the um, uh, we need to know what the best method to dispose of the hazardous waste is. And so it's best to do that. But it also gives you an idea of, you know, what will go into the ground if you do let it run off into the ground. Uh, lastly, uh, certification to safety standards and regulations like the UN regulations for transportation uh, should be done and verified uh, that it's carried out by the shippers. I would like to thank our team as well as our collaborators in academia and industry for all the work we do. And now I'm open to questions. Thank you, Judy. Uh, very informative, very impressive uh, presentation and also the content. So uh, I think everyone will be interested in the materials and we will share the materials after the webinar, as mentioned, in the websites of IATA and also UPU. And uh, let me check uh, the, yeah, very informative, thank you. So no more questions from the Q&A box. And uh, once again, thank you very much for, for the part. So just uh, before I hand over back to Yan, I would like to make a very simple closing remark is that, um, so, um, seems like a uh, lithium battery dangerous schools are uh, very dangerous, but if you if you follow the instruction, comply all the regulation standards, actually dangerous schools is not dangerous. Why dangerous schools lithium batteries seems very dangerous because someone is not following the regulations. They are not complying with the regulations. And so this is the key message I would like to mention before the end of the webinar. And today, if I, if I was not mistaken, I checked the highest number of the attendance during the webinar uh, up to 398 people uh, listening to the topic for the webinar today. So we are all part of the players in the game. So we are all here to make the industry, industry more safe, more efficient. And nothing from my side i would like to hand over back to yan if you have any closing remark for today's yan may i over to you thank you very much matthew uh, i think that uh, we 
are uh, uh, exceeding 20 minutes, uh, the time slot which we dedicated for this session. So I want to be very, very short. I'd like just to share this uh, slide to, uh, to ask you to give us feedback uh, through SurveyMonkey. You can, you can uh, uh, scan a QR code or you can use the link on the slide. Uh, uh, it will help us to to find the right topics for the next webinars, to uh, to evaluate uh, uh, today's uh, uh, webinar and improve maybe for a future. If you have any additional questions which were not raised during the webinar uh, in the QA or or chat uh, box, uh, do not hesitate to contact uh, me or 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 Matthew. <clears throat> you can see the link below and. Uh, uh, I can uh, just uh, uh, confirm that uh, all presentations, videos will be available on the UPU and uh, IATA website. We will <clears throat> send you a link. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you want to contact us, we are more than happy to, to, support, uh, uh, <clears throat> to support you. So thank you very much once again. Uh, I hope that uh, <coughs> your our presentation were useful, and I'm looking forward to uh, meet you again uh, uh, in autumn when we plan to organize uh, another webinar. Thank you, and uh, have a good morning, afternoon, or night. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat>